Pakistan's former president, Pervez Musharraf, rose to power as a man in uniform and stayed that way for much of his presidency. The West treated him as a pariah after he seized control in a military coup in 1999. But the events of September 11th changed that. Almost overnight, Musharraf became a vital ally in the U.S. struggle against the Taliban and al-Qaeda. That relationship with Washington put Musharraf on a collision course with Islamist fighters inside his country. He was never able to stem their rise, particularly in the mountainous regions of Pakistan along the Afghan border. In 2007, Musharraf faced a series of domestic challenges that stripped him of his considerable authority. An attempt to oust the country's top judge triggered mass demonstrations. Musharraf then gave up his post as army chief to continue ruling as a civilian. But the assassination of former prime minister and rival Benazir Bhutto further galvanized public opinion against Musharraf. His party was defeated in elections held the following year. Faced with possible impeachment, Musharraf stepped down that August and went into exile. But the political life of the military man who'd survived several assassination attempts may not be over just yet. Armed with a newly minted political party, Musharraf is pledging to return to Pakistan before national elections in 2013. Mr. President, thanks for your time. And Thank you. Thanks for joining us for uh, Talk to Al Jazeera. It's a pleasure. You're welcome. What are your reflections 10 years since the 9-11 terrorist strikes on America? What are your thoughts, generally speaking? Well, uh, one thinking is whether we are uh, winning or losing, or uh, we must uh, uh, analyze the situation now, having taken a step then, which I thought was very correct, uh, that we acted against terror mm -hmm. after 9-11. You in partnership the, with the United <coughs> States and, yes. 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 and the world. And, and other the coalition partners, partnership sure. In the, with the coalition. I think that was the right step. Uh, but now, after 10 years, uh, when we are talking of quitting in 2014, whether we are going to quit with an unfinished job or after having stabilized Afghanistan is yeah. the very important question that, that uh, is in my mind. Why do you call it why do you use the word quitting in Afghanistan? Is that how you view it? That, that's what everyone seems to be saying. They are using this word, isn't it? Quitting, we need to quit in 2014. There's a lot of talk. Uh, this word is used quite frequently, I think. But uh, It has a it negative appears. connotation. Yes, it has a very negative connotation. Is that how you would view it? Uh, yes, I would view it that way because I, I have always believed that leaving Afghanistan should not be time-related. It should be effect-related. What is the effect that you want to create? You can't put a timeline to it uh, without having, I mean, will you like to meet that timeline even if you have not stabilized Afghanistan? That would be very wrong. So therefore, I have been against this timeline. Uh, so therefore, I take it in a negative connotation. Because you have real concerns about what that would mean, not just for Pakistan, but we can talk about it in terms of Pakistan, but it needs to be considered in your view in the context of the entire region. Region and the world, yes, yes, absolutely. The first victim will be, I think, first... Uh, uh, sufferer will be Pakistan, followed by India, uh, and followed by the whole region and the world. I mean, when we are talking of uh, other than what is happening in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India, may I say, we know about ETIM in China, we know about Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghrib in Algeria and Mali, we know about al qaeda Al-Qaeda in Arab Peninsula in Somalia and Yemen. So all this, uh, if they start developing a nexus, I think it will be very catastrophic for the world. Yeah, that's over. That would be over ten years in Afghanistan. Um, how much longer should anyone be expected to stay uh, in that country? Well, again, uh, I would say we have to. We cannot lose. Yeah. I mean, if you see the situation now, uh, a lot of people think that maybe we are losing, and that's why we are quitting, or that's what why people think? want to. I would put it this way: we we are. Not winning, but we are not losing. I mean, we, we cannot be losing. So it's and a stalemate? We are not losing. Is it a stalemate in your mind? Um, I think so, yes. It is a stalemate. Uh, because guerrilla warfare really uh, persists for long. And it uh, does become a stalemate. If you see guerrilla warfare anywhere in the world, they carry on for decades. So there is no win, no, no loss situation. But we cannot be losing. We cannot be quitting and losing against guerrilla warfare. Uh, against the Taliban or Al-Qaeda, that will be a disastrous. 
Mr. President, how do you win that kind of war? How do you proceed from this point on in the effort to win this war against uh, extremists? Well, there are, there are three uh, facets of uh, war against terror, I would say. Uh, there are three fronts. There is the military front, political and socio-economic front. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we, we tend to overemphasize on the military and hardly look at the political side. Uh, I would say we missed two occasions uh, where we could have converted this into a victory. First of all, in 1996, when Taliban emerged on the scene and they controlled 90% of Afghanistan, we didn't recognize them. Only Pakistan recognized them. I always had said we should change strategy. We should recognize them and then moderate them from within. Had we done that, had they been about they 100... They certainly needed to be moderated, yes, would you agree? Yes, yes, yeah. certainly. I mean, even we, we had our mission there, but that doesn't mean that we accepted their brand of Islam. Their thinking on, uh, their, uh, thinking on Islam is very obscurantist. We didn't, I didn't uh, support that at all, but we recognized them, had diplomatic relations. Had there been 100 missions, maybe we could have saved the Buddha statue. Maybe we even, even have, he, we would have solved this impasse on Osama bin Laden and maybe got him uh, extradited from there. Uh, this 9-11 wouldn't, may never have happened. And the second occasion was immediately after 9-11. When we defeated Al-Qaeda and Taliban, now there was a vacuum in Afghanistan. There was a, this vacuum persisted for two long years till two, early 2004 when Taliban resurgence started. Otherwise, they had helter skelter. They were in the mountains and uh, cities of Pakistan. Their command and organization structure was totally smashed. Now, that was the issue that the military should have given way to the political instrument now. And in these two years, we should have had a representative government with ethnic balance, mm. which means thereby get Pakhtuns on board, which is 50% of Afghanistan. Now we are ruling Afghanistan even now with the dominance of the 8% Panjshiri Tajik element uh, of Afghanistan to the estrangement, uh, to the alienation of all Pakhtuns who have been pushed towards the Taliban. Now that was the second opportunity which was there for two years. We didn't utilize it. We could have got a political resolution after 9-11. But Did you make the that. most of that opportunity? Did Pakistan make the most of that opportunity? Yes. Was there more that Pakistan could have done? No, we, we, we were exactly doing this in Pakistan. In fact, if you look back, the, some suspicions and aspersions were cast on me in 2004-05, I think, when we went for a jirga in South Waziristan, which was not very successful, but they didn't appreciate the idea. What was the strategy behind it? Strategy was to wean away Pakhtuns from the Taliban. I coined a term, all Taliban are Pakhtuns, but all Pakhtuns are not Taliban. Yeah. So let's get the Pakhtuns away from the Taliban and use them to counter the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda. Um, let me circle back to some reflections after 9-11. Uh, Do you ever have second thoughts about the decision you took on behalf of your country to cooperate with the United States? I, I know you write in your book that you war game the United States. So you obviously thought about what would be the options if we don't cooperate. Yeah. But uh, do you wonder whether it was ultimately the right decision uh, in terms of what you think it cost the country? Well, I think it was absolutely the right decision because of many things. One was the implications, as you said, of not cooperating. But leave that aside. The first question that I asked myself do we want Talibanization of Pakistan? Are we the same people? Do we want the same obscurantist views, the radical views of Islam to be imposed on Pakistan also, that we cooperate with them and when to give rise to these religious extremists and we have a Pakistan which is dominated by radical obscurantist Islamic views, people who don't even didn't know. Didn't want that. No, we didn't want that. Didn't want that, yeah. So therefore, the answer was no. The bombs start exploding, uh, the carpet bombing of Afghanistan. And quickly, you've got a problem now in Pakistan. You've got remnants of the Taliban. You've got remnants of Al-Qaeda now flowing across the border into your country. Yes. And, and they mixed with other extremist elements in your country, correct? Is that correct? Yes, yes they are. 
So, so then the question becomes, as you look at what happened in those years, what happened to your country? Because you reflect upon that. Yeah. I, I come back to the original question. Was it too great a cost to pay? Did you put your country through too much suffering in making the decision to align with the United States after 9-11? Uh, no, I think uh, as the situation stands, at least the Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda element in Pakistan is not much. They were in our cities. We caught all these important uh, personalities of uh, Al-Qaeda from Pakistan. So Pakistan, we have no more Al-Qaeda people in the cities. We don't see them. Even in the mountains, I think now it is not Al-Qaeda. It is Taliban who yeah. rule the roost. Uh, so we have at least managed to, to uh, at least dominate, uh, if not totally eliminate Al-Qaeda. Uh, it is now the Taliban. I mean, even Al Qaeda. Look at Osama bin Laden. He was hiding in that house in uh, in Abbottabad. So he was. So look at Al Qaeda's organization. Its yeah. structure. It's all gone. It's now the Taliban who have emerged because of our own follies. Maybe, maybe our short-sighted, incomplete action of only. Give me an example of that. I, I, that's you, you. You're admitting to something here. A failing somehow. Yes. What is it specifically? I mean, failing of not using the political instrument at the right time. I, I've said that. Yeah. We had a two-year window of opportunity. Use the political element then, a political and socio-economic. Did you ever meet Osama bin Laden? Never. Did you ever have a face-to-face -face with Mullah Omar? Never. Never. So it, Never. The, the, the outreach was just through emissaries? Is that, what, is that how that happened? The uh, outreach to try to negotiate the exit of Osama bin Laden, for example, that was just done through emissaries? Yes, it, no, uh, well, through ISI mainly, and then through many religious lobbies that I sent. Were you really surprised that Osama bin Laden was found in Abbottabad? Very surprised, extremely surprised. Tell me why you were surprised. There was, he, it looks as though he was there uh, for a period of five years, whatever it is, and that he was actually there while you were in the presidency. That, that, uh, that is the main thing. Frankly, this five-year period, uh, I am not, it doesn't appeal to my logic, uh, frankly. You're a little dubious of it. Yes, very much. Uh, and I've always been saying in my interviews... The is that because you would like him not to have been in the country while you were president? Uh, no, it makes no it because, because I'm very sure of one thing. I am 500% sure of one thing. Uh, that I didn't know. <laughs> Whether one believes it or not, let the world not believe it, whoever it is. If they don't believe it, well, but I know, you know that. you know so many people are skeptical of, of, of just that statement. No, they may be skeptical, but I know that it is true. At least I, in my heart, know that it is true. And it is true. Uh, so when, but, but I have my doubt whether he was there for five years. If he was there for five years, locked up in a room, I mean, uh, not communicating with anyone, is this possible? Uh, uh, I don't think that is, appears to be for possible. Uh, he may be coming and going, or he may, be, may have come there a short while ago, but I don't know. Five years is just a statement given by one of the women there, or one of the wives. Do you believe your ISI, under your command, uh, with you as president, would have found him if he were there? Do you believe uh, your army intelligence would have found him if, if, I was if, there. If, if, if he were there when you were president? Is that part of the reason why you're not no, sure no. about this five-year period? No, no, no. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that because they, the same ISI, the same operatives didn't find him. So what would I have done if I was there? Maybe they wouldn't have found him still. It's, it's an immense failing, isn't it? Yes, it's a, it's a terrible failing. But um, uh, the first question that comes is, is there complicity or negligence? I mean, let's analyze that. Uh, I personally very strongly believe that there was no complicity. One reason I've given. If he was there for five years, let's take it. I didn't know, so therefore there is no complicity. Now, but however, leave that aside. Now, if, they, uh, if the ISI had hit him, would they leave him unattended like that? Uh, there is no guard around in the house. Uh, there is no, there, nobody guarding him. There's no Doesn't that speak to comfort, complicity? He felt he was protected? No. Wouldn't that speak to no, that as well? No, not at all. Not at all. I mean, he would have escaped such a valuable target. Would anyone, any any leader, if I was, I mean, if I knew it, would I 
not gain out of it, wouldn't use this as a leverage, as the bargaining uh, tool. I mean, what all could have been done with this uh, if one knew that? And he was there by any government, by ISI or the army. So explain to me, Mr. President, look, you, you, you are intimately aware of the inner workings of the ISI, of the army, obviously. It goes without saying. You've acknowledged that this was a failing of intelligence. Yes. <laughs> so with your knowledge, can you explain how such a failing could have transpired? I mean, who would have dropped the ball? How does something like that, can you, can you create that scenario where yeah. he is on the ground for four years, five years, yeah, well. near this military academy, and yet no one knows? Can you describe yeah. how that failing comes together? Yeah, I think intelligence failings do occur. After all, if you go back to 9-11, how is it that 18 people were under training for months? How is it that they hijacked four aircraft from four different airfields? How is it that they left the main flight path and headed toward Pentagon and, and where was the CIA? Wasn't it asleep? So let's take it, ISI was also asleep. But I will leave that aside. So such failings do occur. Now here, if he was there, he wasn't using communication at all. One thing is clear. There was no communication. So therefore, one had to bank on human intelligence. What is human intelligence? Human intelligence of people around. People around saying that the man is inside. Now, lot of all, almost all the television channels of Pakistan have gone around in that area interviewing people. Not one has said that we knew Osama bin Laden is inside. They thought that there is some kind of a drug dealer inside mm -hmm. because there are people who have, uh, live in such houses very privately and people don't get near them because they know that they are dangerous kind of people. So other than that, Osama bin Laden, nobody knew. So therefore, I think it's very possible that they didn't know. Are you and, satisfied and also with that? I, I mean, honestly, are you satisfied with that? that yes, very satisfied. Yeah. It's a terrible negligence. I mean, uh, I, I shouldn't say I'm satisfied. I would take severe action against whoever was there in charge of intelligence and didn't know. But let me say, a lot of people talk of this, about being a garrison town, the academy being there and other training. It, it's, a, it's a hill station. It's a, it's a tourist resort. All the routes to the northern areas, to our mountains, go through Aptabad. People come and live there. And uh, they, it's a town of about six, seven hundred thousand. It's not a barricaded town like a fort uh, that it's walled or barbed wired around. All these, all these uh, uh, institutions are open. People go there, live in their messes. Friends and relatives live in messes. And there are tourists, there are education institutions there coming and going. It's an open and there's uh, civilian and military men are intermingled, living together. So it's not such a garrison uh, as one would perceive. So acknowledge for me the common sense possibility here that Osama bin Laden could have been in Abbottabad, could have been in some way protected, perhaps by the ISI, perhaps by members of the military, perhaps by another network. Uh, acknowledge for me that that is possible and perhaps the information was never communicated up the food chain. Isn't that possible? No, well, that's also Too far-fetched for you. Well, I mean, I, I even uh, evaluated in my own mind, if it was there for two years, is it possible that the ISI and the army was hiding from me? <coughs> One is at the top level, of course, the decision makers in ISI and Army. I was the Army chief myself. So could they be hiding from me? Not at all. If they were hiding, I being from them, I being a military man, their second and third tier officers, somebody would have come and told me there's something fishy going on. I would have known it. So therefore, policy makers, they're out of the question that they were following a different policy. Now, when you are asking somebody lower in the ranks, doing this as a rogue element, doing this, protecting him and putting there. I mean, uh, would that rogue element bring him to such a prominent place, to put him in Aptabad? And also, we transfer people in two to three years maximum. So if a major who may have been in charge of a detachment there gets transferred, 
he hands over to the next incoming major how does he know who is this man what is he, what are his attitudes is a new new man coming in he can't hand him over to the other man that we've got this man hiding there please, please look after him and don't tell anyone these things don't happen as you know there was a, a murder trial uh, ongoing over the assassination of the former prime minister benazir bhutto you have been asked to come before prosecutors, answer questions. To this point, you haven't. You've been mailed questions and asked to respond, and you haven't. Why is that? This is a criminal case, and it is most ridiculous that my name has been added as because I am supposed to have been in charge or I failed to provide security. Therefore, my name is included in the list of suspects. Now, uh, in this, I have to appear personally in the court. It cannot be done through any lawyer appearing in the court. Now, because of many other reasons, I am outside and I don't want to go back to appear in the court. But when I go in on the 23rd of March, when I go back to Pakistan, I certainly will go and appear in the court and answer questions. So you do plan to answer Yes. Uh, the question yes, is being posed there's by... No, there's no issue. I don't have to hide anything. But you knew of the threats. You said you, 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 you knew of the threats. Obviously, I was aware and I was aware of everything. Yeah. I, I knew of the threat on her. I told her that there is threat on you when, before, the, before she went to, uh, uh, on that motorcade in Karachi. Yeah. We got this information and we got it from here, actually. You know, you've always reacted a bit emotionally when uh, folks have suggested or asked the question, simply asked the question, were you in any way involved in the murder of the former prime minister? Why does that strike you so, so personally? It is personal because, uh, first of all, I, uh, I have a certain character. I have certain principles. I've been brought up in a certain way in my family, in my household. I've grown up in a certain atmosphere where uh, I don't, uh, or my family, or my, my nature is not getting people assassinated and eliminated like that. Tell me why on earth <laughs> you're going back to Pakistan. Yes, yes. A lot of people ask me, a lot of my close relatives uh, ask me. Yeah, what uh, are you thinking? Why are you going back? Yes, Do you really uh, want to put yourself uh, through this again? Yes. Uh, it's Pakistan. I think that they, sometimes there's a cause uh, bigger than yourself. I mean, uh, I'm very comfortable here I, and a lot of respect given to me all over the world. I, Harry Walker Agency looks uh, after my lecture interests very well. Uh, so what is my issue? I can live anywhere in the world and be very comfortable. The, the issue is the Pakistan. I think Pakistan is in a state where it was in 1999 when I uh, salvaged it from a failed and defaulted state and brought it up and put it in the ranks of the next 11, N11, one of the N11 countries after the BRIC4, the next 11 economically vibrant countries of the world. Our growth was one of the top in the world. And all our macroeconomic indicators, all the issues of welfare of the people, development of the state, each and every element of that, of the socio-economic development of Pakistan was going rising. Even when I left, it was rising. So what's happened since? You you talk about sitting in your office, in your study, and thinking about your country. What's happened since? And, and what is it about you, your leadership, makes you believe that you can go back and, and make a difference? Yes. Yes, I, I will give you the answer to this. What happened immediately? How come? How is it that in, within the first year, FDI dries up? And the dollar, which we maintained for eight years at 60 rupees, goes to 87. What happens? Major flight of capital. Why? Lack of trust. Who, who, by whom? By Pakistanis. They took all their money, they ran away. Lack of trust and confidence in the government. FDI not coming. Why? Lack of trust and confidence in the government. So basically, it's an issue of trust and confidence in the leadership, in the government, by the people and countries around the world. So this is, and the investors. 
So I think uh, these are main issues. It's just because of this that all this happened. Nothing else. Mr. President, thank you.